In this chapter, we take a close look at the prehistoric Aegean. These are the civilizations that populated the Aegean before the ancient Greeks started recording history through writing. Two of the earliest pieces of literature are the Iliad and the Odyssey by the Greek poet Homer. These epic poems feature cities, kings, and mythical creatures with roots in the prehistoric Aegean civilizations. You're probably familiar with both of these stories. In a nutshell, the Iliad centers on the war between the Greeks and the Trojans. Achilles was the hero of the Iliad and the greatest of all the Greek warriors. Paris was the prince of Troy, and he abducted Helen. She was originally married to King Menelaus. You may have heard of the Trojan horse, which was a fake gift made by the Greeks and presented at the gates of Troy. On the outside, it looked like a large wooden statue, but it contained Greek warriors hidden within. When the city opened its gates, the warriors popped out, and long story short, the city fell. Actually, so much more happens in this epic poem, but for now, I'm just trying to jog your memory and set the stage. So you might be asking yourself, why are we talking about Homer's epic poems? In this chapter, we take a close look at the civilizations that populated the Aegean before the ancient Greeks started recording history. That is, before Homer, before Iliad, and before the Odyssey. The cities, kings, and mythical creatures in Homer's tales have roots in these prehistoric civilizations. Art of the prehistoric Aegean can be broken down into three geographic areas. The Cycladic art is from the Cycladic Islands, Minoan art is from the island of Crete, and Helladic art from the Greek mainland. Marble was abundant in the Cycladic Islands. The male harp player is an example of Cycladic art. It is carved from marble and is made from simple geometric shapes and large flat planes. Minoan artwork is found on the island of Crete. The city of Knossos was a legendary home of King Minos. Knossos is where the hero Theseus hunted the bull man Minotaur in his labyrinth. According to the legend, the king's daughter helped Theseus find his way out of the maze by giving him a spindle of thread to mark his path. This fresco depicts the Minoan ceremony of bull leaping, in which young men grasp the horns of a bull and jump onto its back. This work displays the artistic invention of depicting young women with fair skin and young men with dark skin, common in ancient work, to distinguish female from male. The figures are highly stylized with pinched waists and curving lines. Only the top portion of this piece, called the harvester vase, remains. The rest of the vase pictured here is a reconstruction. This is an example of Minoan relief sculpture. Remember, the term relief sculpture means that the work stands out in relief to a flat surface, so it projects off of a surface rather than standing freestanding in the round. We see a crowd of harvesters singing and shouting as they go to or return from the fields. This is quite a contrast to the stiff and static forms depicted in Egyptian art of the time. In the late 1800s, a German archaeologist, Henrik Schleimann, studied the cities from the Iliad and the Odyssey. He uncovered Mycenae on the Greek mainland, where he believed King Agamemnon, Menelaus's brother, once ruled. In this picture, we see the citadel of Tiryns, located about 10 miles from Mycenae. Many hundreds of years later, the Greeks marveled at the ruins and believed mere humans could not have built these enormous structures. They believed these citadels to have been created by mythical creatures they called the Cyclops, a race of one-eyed giants. Architectural historians use the term Cyclopean masonry to refer to the huge, roughly cut stone blocks forming the massive walls of Mycenaean sites. In this long gallery with, uh, within the walls of Tiryns, the Mycenaeans piled irregular cyclopean blocks in horizontal courses and then cantilevered them to form a corbelled arch. The Lion Gate is the outer gateway of the stronghold at Mycenae. It creates a pinch point through which enemies would have to pass. This was erected a few generations before the presumed date of the Trojan War. 
Elite families buried their dead outside the citadel walls in beehive-shaped tombs covered by earthen mounds. These are called tholos tombs. Here we see the structure from the outside. Notice the cor corbelled arch over the entryway. A long passageway called a dromos leads from the doorway to the burial chamber, or tholos. The tholos is simply corbelled stone courses laid on a circular base to form a dome. The stones are overlapped and laid in a tighter and tighter circle until they form a domed interior. Mycenae used the technique of repoussé to fashion metal. In this technique, a thin sheet of metal is hammered into the desired shape. This is a funerary mask found in a royal shaft grave. It is one of the first attempts at life sculpture in Greece. It is interesting to compare this work with Egyptian portraiture. Keep in mind the Mycenaean metal worker was one of the first in Greece to produce a sculpted image of a human face, whereas the Tutankhamun mask stands in a long line of Egyptian sculpture. Finally, a crater is a bowl used for mixing wine and water. This crater, commonly called the warrior vase, depicts soldiers marching off to war. By Homer's time, the climax of Aegean civilization was a distant memory. The men and women of Crete and Mycenae, people like Minos, Agamemnon, and Helen of Troy, had assumed the stature of heroes from a long lost golden age. That's it for today, guys. I hope you found today's lecture useful, and that wraps up our unit on the prehistoric Aegean. Have a great day.